Good afternoon, everyone. This is Roy Oppenheim, and I wanted to thank you all for joining us for our second Zoom at noon as we all try and work together through uh, this crazy, crazy time of, of dealing with this pandemic. Um, I want to first of all uh, introduce you all to Zach Shulamith, who's, uh, who you may be able to see uh, in, in, in the screen, I hope, and he's going to be joining us as a special guest today. Zach and I have known each other for 12 years since we started uh, defending uh, people in foreclosure, and he's been helping people with, with bankruptcy for, for, for many years. He's a top bankruptcy lawyer, and unlike last time when we were working together but not that close, we're going to be working much closer together uh, and almost be tied at the hip, and, and, and we formed somewhat of a confederation so we, we can help uh, our clients through this, this crazy process. Zach is a board, is board certified in both business and consumer bankruptcy law and is the immediate past president of the bankruptcy bar of the Southern District of Florida. But more importantly, he's a friend and a colleague and someone who I tremendously respect. Today, we're gonna to be trying to cover a lot of ground. We're gonna be talking about uh, society and our social fabric and its needs and, and how we've gotten to where we are. We're gonna talk about the economy and how uh, it, is, it is effectively rapidly, rapidly changing and shedding and in some many ways collapsing. We're going to be talking about property loss mitigation, how we as individuals can get through this individually and together. We're going to be talking about property loss mitigation, what to do with your mortgages or your leases and, and, and your rents. And then uh, Zach particularly is going to assist me in, in discussing uh, bankruptcy options and how to pre-plan for bankruptcy and, and, and the things that we need to do in the event uh, we need to go bankrupt. And then business loss mitigation, we'll also be talking about businesses and what they, they need to do. One thing that we found uh, from the last crisis is that those people who addressed head on their, their economic situation were the first to come out of the crisis. And by being able to come out of the crisis first, they were able to rebuild and get strong. Uh, just no one expected that it would only be a 12 year run and that we would be in a situation that in some ways is much more severe and dire. For those of us who know our firm, we were at the forefront of uh, the crisis last time around, we, we started our blog called In the Trenches, where we literally were, were describing from the ground what people were experiencing. Obviously, South Florida was ground zero for, for this last crisis. Hopefully, this time it may not be ground zero, but it looks like it's going to be something close to ground zero again. And more importantly, we want to explain to people what we learned from our experiences from the last 10 and 12 years of helping people get through their, their personal situations to make sure that, that we all can get out of this situation and be better and stronger individually and as a society uh, at the end of the day. Our firm uh, was founded in 1991 by Ellen Polalski Oppenheim, my wife and myself. We now have, if we go to the next slide, uh, we have a total of, of five lawyers and Zach, who's, who's, who Zach and his firm is gonna be working with us. And so we, we're bringing on more and more lawyers uh, as we have to deal with this, this highly, highly unusual situation. I want to thank pa Paolo Bagara for assisting me in preparing this presentation. And as much as Lance doesn't want to thank, have, have me thank him, I do want to thank my son for also assisting, specifically because he hasn't been home in years and, and, we, and we love to have him here. Um, and it is one of those unusual circumstances where we all have our children at home, our older children at home, our grandchildren, our dogs, and we're all working from home. And if you haven't noticed, I am not in the office and we have literally transformed our entire house into a work environment. Uh, and it's, it's the most unusual thing that, that I've ever experienced in my life. But we're, we're gonna embrace it and we're gonna go with it. And, and here we are. I wanna start with uh, uh, Hippocrates. Hippocrates. I was really unaware until we did a little research that the, the term uh, desperate times requires desperate measures. And it, it's been translated a few times over the last few hundred years. With, it literally, it means extreme bads to extreme remedies. But in fact, uh, he is the one who created the Hippocratic Oath. And in fact, it is these uh, extreme bads and extreme measures, Latin saying, uh, meaning that at some times uh, we need to take extreme measures, including what we're doing right now uh, to deal with, with health issues. Great, the great ironies back then, they had very little in the area of antibiotics and other things that we've become so accustomed to. And in this particular situation, we feel like we're back uh, in, in the stone ages in terms of, of, of health, our health. But in any event, we're gonna get, get through this. Um, our last discussion uh, dealt with um, how we're all adapting and there have been so many changes in, in terms of our society um, just in the past few weeks and months. And of course the real question is going to be in, in terms of real estate, 
will we get back to the old normal or will we have a new normal when, when things resolve? Uh, will students still fly away to colleges far away from home or will parents want to keep their kids closer because they're not sure if these universities are going to be able to really take care of them if, if there's an emergency? Um, and then the other thing is offices. Are people going to still have huge offices or are they going to be like our firm, our firms, which both have become virtual firms. Uh, the law firm had the capacity for years, but the title company never envisioned that we would be able through remote online notarization to actually function and operate, albeit maybe just slightly slower for the time being. But ultimately, we will be faster and more efficient uh, by, by not all working in the same office. And it's strange, and, and, and it's something that we're all still trying to wrap our heads around. But yes, we are closing uh, transactions. We're doing them uh, with li as little personal contact as possible. We're switching to remote online notarization, which means that documents don't get printed, documents don't get, get saved in, in file cabinets, documents get electronically recorded, everyone gets an electronic copy, and more importantly, the notarization process occurs through an online huddle where everyone gets together like, like, like today, and, and, and yet you have witnesses and notary online, and uh, the deal gets done. And so we are all changing and evolving at, at, at warp speed. Um, you know, in terms of schools, kids are home right now. Some schools are canceling the rest of the year. Otherwise, uh, there, people are learning from home, and it's, and it's becoming just a, a remarkable virtual world. Supposedly, China things are getting a little better. I don't know. Uh, New York looks pretty grim right now. Uh, and, the, and the governor just uh, in the state of Florida has asked the president to declare uh, the state, the entire state of Florida, uh, a, a, a state of emergency. And uh, with that, there will be legal implications for what we all do and, and, and how we, we practice our, our respective crafts. Um, in terms of the economy, uh, the Bank, Bank of America, according to the Wall Street Journal, has, has now officially said that if if we are that, that we are indeed already in a recession, and that while last time there were two million jobs that were shed from the economy, it is anticipated that there will be probably three and a half million jobs lost. The thought is that the economy will contract not by one, two, or three percent, which is what economists are always talking about, but by twenty percent. So that is a huge, huge number. And what's kind of interesting is that last time around there seemed to be this desire to pin fault on the homeowners on on the mortgage brokers and, 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 and parts of the government uh, for helping allow the, the real estate bubble to get so large and then to burst. And of course, there was subsequent criticism uh, about the government's response, which at the time seemed to be rather uh, slow and, and certainly not helping the people that were most in need, the homeowners. This time around, I don't think there's a fault. There's not a blame game in terms of who in the economy is responsible for this. And so that's a good thing. The other thing is, is that this time it, it seems that, that the, the help that comes a, along eventually will be the type of help that will try and help everyone. But as I warned people 12 years ago, do not expect the cavalry to come and bail you out. Now, there may be some assistance, there may be a $1,000 check or a $1,200 check to some people. How long will that money really last? And so our job is to say, hey, we got a job to do, let's get the job done, let's figure out what our, what our strategy is gonna be. How do we reinvent ourselves? And how do we deal with our old debts so that we can shed our debts and, and still contribute to society and remain relevant and, and, and enjoy our lives? Obviously, the most important thing during these next few weeks and maybe months is that we take care of ourselves and, and that we have shelter and that we're able to distance ourselves. But that affects a lot of the real estate questions that we're going to address in a little while. What happens to contracts that are in the middle of, of, of closing, that people have just entered into, lease agreements, uh, banks who are walking away from, from, from obligations, uh, Airbnb that is willy-nilly canceling reservations without uh, really uh, talking to the, the property owners and in violation apparently uh, of, of their own uh, policies and procedures. And so it's going to be a crazy time. And it's also a crazy time because the courts really aren't functioning at full capacity. And with that, people are going to have to figure out how to help themselves using the legal system, but in a way that doesn't necessarily involve the court system. Uh, in terms of the markets, the, the stock market is continuing to go uh, in a way that, that is affecting people in a very negative way, but in some ways uh, could have some impact on the, on the real estate market. While most people are thinking the real estate market will take a tumble, uh, there are those including, uh, I believe it was Schiller, uh, who was very involved with, with the prediction of the bubble last time around, that he's a Yale economist, uh, who had suggested that 
that asset of, of a single family home may be a very, very important asset to those people who realize that they may need to shelter in place. I, I've seen some off-color jokes on the internet from realtors who are saying that when they're gonna show a home, they're gonna say, instead of saying, isn't this a wonderful view? Aren't those palm tree trees beautiful? Uh, I've never seen so many palm trees in a, in a view before. They're gonna say, wouldn't this be a wonderful home to stay in if you, if you had to uh, uh, hibernate for, for a period of time or if you were under quarantine? And so there are homes that people are gonna prefer to be in rather, multi, that rather than multifamily homes, uh, you know, condos or, or, or structures where you have to worry about touching the elevator buttons and, and things of that nature. So it's kind of a very interesting situation. I do want to talk about small businesses in particular. And by the way, there, there are two things that I, that I want to have happen here. One is I need for you all to start asking questions and I need for you all to help participate in, in our polling questions. And so Lance, why don't we pull up the first polling question here if we can. Okay, there's a, our first polling question is, do you think the crisis is worse, the same, or not as bad as 2008 during the Great Recession? Or do you think it is too soon to tell? And it's a multiple choice question. And obviously there is no right or wrong answer. But I'd be curious for, for uh, and I think how many people do we have on? We have probably around 75 people or so. 86. 86? Mm -hmm. About 86 people on the, on the call right now. So um, I'd like to see what you all say. And there are some other questions. And it's really important that, that we answer this so we feel like we're all in the same boat together. Um, Okay, we, we're getting answers here. Uh, it looks like the winners are gonna be uh, too soon to tell if it's gonna be worse and worse. <laughs> and, and I would personally agree that those out is how I feel. In my gut, if things go to the, in, in, in the direction of Italy or China, this is gonna be something much worse than we dealt with last time. It's already much worse because last time we weren't just dealing, we were just dealing with an economic situation and it was a bad situation and people did get thrown out of the house, they got displaced. That there was improprieties in the, in the legal system, the foreclosure crisis hit because of the real estate crisis, because of the debt crisis. This time, it's more complicated because we have a, a health overlay. And that is that even if we did foreclose someone, we could create a massive, massive health crisis if we have someone who's infected who ends up having to move into another home with other people or God forbid was, was, was homeless. And so for that reason, the governments already in, in, in those areas that have been affected have put moratoriums on evictions and on final foreclosures. It doesn't mean you can't get foreclosed, it just means you can't get kicked out of your house until the, until the health crisis, not the economic crisis, until the health crisis ends. And we'll talk a little bit about what that, that really means. Uh, let, let's go to the next slide. Um, the government has already started a, one program, obviously the second program that everyone's waiting for hasn't, hasn't uh, it, it's still stuck in, in committee and people in the, in the respective uh, part, uh, Chambers of Congress are, are obviously feuding. And then of course the issue is can members of Congress vote remotely, which has never happened in the history of the United States. But since so many members of the Senate are already self-quarantining or, or actually have the virus, uh, this is something that, that's going to evolve. So there's free testing, paid sick leave, expansions on, on, on the Family Leave Act. Uh, the, st the stimulus project is, is still in the works and the individual, checks, the individual checks that people are supposed to get if they get is also something that hasn't happened. And of course the tax credits and bailouts is something that's being discussed. In terms of the bailouts, uh, a lot of folks are hoping that if banks do get bailed out, that that money will specifically be used to do modifications and workouts for, for, for homeowners and not be used to buy back stock and do other things that, uh, that some of the companies did last time around that, that, that pissed a lot of people off. Next slide. Or is there a question? question? Huh? Let's see, hang on. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm not gonna mention who the question is. If banks are bailed out again, it would be important to have a legislation to really help the homeowners this time. As in the last crisis of 2008, the government bailed out the banks, but the most affected were the homeowners losing their homes. I absolutely agree 100%. And I think a lot of that had to do with moral hazard. That had to do with the idea that, that some people should have had personal accountability and responsibility for taking out too much debt, for uh, being irresponsible. I don't believe that that, that that was in fact what happened. I think a lot of people got duped. A lot of people believed uh, in a system that, that, that did not work properly. This time it's not like that. And so I'm hopeful that at the end of the day, uh, the homeowners and the individual consumers will in fact be the ones uh, that will uh, survive. Um, one of the things that they're looking at is trying to preserve small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of, backbone of the US economy. They are the folks 
who actually uh, are part of the American dream. Part of the American dream is to own your own home and, and to have your own business and, and to be your own boss. And if we lose that small business, the engine of, of, of new ideas, the engine of, of, of growth, the engine of, of jobs, then I think our economy will not just be in a, in a great recession, this could be, end up being a depression and it could ultimately be the Great Depression, greater than the Great Depression. And so hopefully the bailout this time around will be targeted to those parts of the economy. I mean, I wanna give you an example. In terms of restaurants, the National Restaurant Association is suggesting that probably 75%, we can go to the next slide, I guess, 75% of most of, of family-owned restaurants in, in the United States will not survive. Let me repeat that, 75% will not survive. Most of them are mom and pops, they have a high overhead, they have very low margins. They rely on, on daily cash flow to survive and pay their employees, many of whose employees survive on tips. They uh, sometimes have a high debt load and sometimes don't have any debt at all. It's kind of an interesting situation. They may have a high debt, but they don't have credit lines that they can tap. Uh, many of them did not devise a no takeout environment. Uh, most of them will lose all their employees. And uh, they will uh, also, you know, when the economy comes back, uh, not be uh, available to um, use their employees because their employees will have moved on. We have a question here. I read your blog last night on force majeure. Okay, we're, we're gonna hold off on that question. How can, okay, both these questions we're gonna ask, but I wanna keep going down this list here, but thank you. Uh, and, and the most important thing is if they don't hang on to their employees, those employees may not be available to the uh, restaurateurs, the owners of the restaurants, because many of them will have moved on and they will have moved on probably to different industries. They'll probably move on to Publix, to Amazon, those parts of the economy that are gonna to continue to grow. Let, let's go to the next polling question, Lance, if we can. If you own a business, are you currently able to stay in business or are you unfortunately having to close your business to multiple choice? The choices are trying to stay in business, closed or having a closed business, don't know what to do yet. Now this is great. Almost 85% of the folks on the phone are trying to keep in business and keep their employees. And I, I commend all of you for doing that. Uh, a few, 2%, you know, have, have had to try and close your business. And of course, 16% are not sure what they're gonna end up doing. When you make that decision, you will need to speak to a lawyer, whether it's Zach or myself or someone else, but you will need to do that because there are implications, tax implications. There will be uh, uh, implications in terms of credits that you would be entitled to if you kept your employees. And there will, of course, be bankruptcy implications if you decide to, to close your business. There are going to be winners and losers in this economy. And, and, and I'm talking about the new reality economy. Obviously, the grocery stores, as we talked about, the phone guys who are installing all the remote telephone stuff were just going crazy, including the internet providers and the network specialists. Lawyers and accountants will always be needed when the economy is doing poorly or when the economy is doing well. And so they, they won't be, be big losers here. Uh, and realtors, I think at the end of the day, while they may go on some sort of hiatus or sabbatical for a brief period of time because people don't want to have strangers coming through their house and doing open houses and, and they themselves don't want to bring you know, germs back to their family, there will be a, 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 a period of time that there will be less activity but then there will be remarkable new activity because of so many changes that will occur in people's lifestyles. And those changes always create transactional activity for, for, the, for, for real estate. I will mention that Compass just announced that, which you know, was, a, was an up, up and coming real estate organization, that they're massively laying off people right now. And so that's, that's it's very unfortunate. Um, next. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about foreclosures. In particular, right now, there, there may be foreclosures filed, but in all likelihood, the government is gonna limit any foreclosures being filed if they're backed by any government entity like Fannie or, or, or Freddie, which means that people who file foreclosures right now are probably gonna be looked upon rather poorly. So there's probably gonna be a 60 or 90 day moratorium. But I will tell you that the foreclosure mills are ramping up right now and they will be fast and furious when they start filing those foreclosures. When they do, folks like us who were previously involved in foreclosure defense will, will have to once again you know, bear our armor and do what we have to do to keep folks in place. But there will be other opportunities because I think banks realize that they ending up with a bunch of real estate may not be the best thing. 
The alternative to that argument is that you do have large institutional buyers of real estate out there now, backed with, with lots of money from sovereign wealth funds and, and, and also from, from Wall Street money that may want to buy up those homes so that they can then rent them out. And while the United States right now has about 10% of its housing stock owned by commercial enterprises, before the foreclosure uh, crisis last time, that number was only around two or 3%. So it grew around 500% over the past 10 or 12 years. It is conceivable that if this foreclosure wave came through, that it won't be homeowners and mom and pops that are gonna end up buying back those foreclosures but rather it's going to be institutions that are then going to rent them out. After the crisis, there will clearly be a rush, but the question is who is going to buy those homes? Short sales, what are they? They are sales that are subject to lender's approval, usually because the property's value is upside down. Right now, it's unclear if the values are upside down or not for the simple reason that the values haven't been repegged to the new reality. Historically, the lenders have been waiving their deficiencies, and a lot of times they have gotten that money back as part of the bailout. So when the last question said that, you know, did the, did the banks get the bailout or did the homeowners, if in fact you don't get hit with a deficiency judgment and, and the bank is taking the hit on the difference between the, the value of the property and how much you owe, meaning that you owe more than the value of the home. So if you, the value of the home is only worth 200000 and you owe 300000 the bank is losing $100,000. A lot of times that $100,000 was absorbed by the government. So part of the bailout occurred through that way. The other question is gonna be is will the IRS waive what is called uh, income from, from deficiency, deficiency income. So if you, if you are getting a waiver of deficiency in the past, that, is, that has been deal, deemed as, as income that you would actually have to pay. But during both the Bush and the Obama administrations, those provisions had changed. And more recently under the Trump administration, uh, loan forgiveness income, was deemed income. I fully believe that that will change again and go back to the way it was during Obama and, and the Bush administration. Thanks. Modifications. We do believe that uh, the loans, are, that the banks this time around are going to be, uh, I think, more hospitable to modifications. I think they may have a fund to fund those modifications depending on how this, this bailout looks. And so I think in most cases, if the economy can, can in, can come back quickly, that in all likelihood we would be able to modify many, many loans and, and avoid uh, foreclosure. Next. Reinstatements. That's going to be tough. That means that you're going to have to have a cash reserve. You, you ended up not paying the mortgage for a few months, and then you're going to reinstate all the back payments. Presumably penalty may be waived. Maybe some interest will be waived, but certainly the, the, the principal will not be waived that, that you were supposed to pay back. But that is something certainly that uh, we think is, 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 a, is a possibility. Okay, there's a question. Okay, let's, let's see what the questions are. Okay. Uh, I read your blog lines. Okay, okay, here. Please, at some point, oops, we got a lot of questions here. Roy, the amount of two million, two, two, excuse me, Roy, the amount of two trillion dollars coming in the USA economy may have a positive impact. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're, you're looking at what, what may be called helicopter money. I mean, this is kind of money that just comes down and pours down and we have to be able to spend it. But, but if the stores aren't open, if you can't travel, if the airlines are grounded, which by the way, they may be, if, if you haven't heard that, uh, if they're grounded, because if they don't get grounded, all the, all the airlines are gonna go bankrupt because they can't keep operating with no one in their seats and it's like ridiculous. So assuming the airlines get grounded and we can all you know, go out and socialize again, it could be an unbelievable recovery. That is a big if, and that's a big but. And the big but is, do we have enough money to at least keep people so they're not gonna starve in their homes, that there's not gonna be insurrection, and that we're gonna maintain social harmony during this crisis? And uh, you all, all you have to do is watch some of these, what were supposedly science fiction movies about these kinds of crises. Well, in fact, they weren't science fiction. What they were, they were docu-future movies. They were movies about what could happen and was going to happen, and in fact did happen. And so let's go to the next question. Uh, how much do you estimate the value of the properties will go down? You know, I don't have a crystal ball, but, but you know, I think some people are suggesting that different segments may go down in different amounts. Um, but I would, I would venture to guess 10 to 20%. I mean, if the economy is going to collapse 20%, it would make sense that it would go down 20%. You could argue if the stock market is down 30%, then maybe house values will go down 30%. But then you could make an argument that money, people are going to pull money out of the stock market and put it into real estate, because at least they can enjoy it and they can keep their family safe when they have a home. So I don't know the answer. Uh, how far can residential and business tenants leverage force majeure to negotiate the rent house? Okay, we're going to ask that question. We're going to respond to that at the end because we have a section on force majeure that we talked about uh, in, the, in the outline. 
Okay, no evictions. My husband and I own 20 rental properties. We've owned them 30 years. This is our sole source of income. We went through our savings in 2008. If we cannot evict people that stop paying rent, how are we supposed to survive? These are our lower end rentals. Most of the tenants will take advantage of the no eviction ruling. We are seniors ready to retire in the next two to three years. How can we navigate this new crisis and survive? That is a fantastic question. And, and I am not an oracle and I don't have the answer to that. I think there's gonna to have to be shared, um, I, I think pain that has to occur here. Obviously, from a human perspective, you cannot kick these people out on the street right now if they have lost their jobs and they are going to be a public health risk to you, your family, and especially if you're older, you know, your friends and your, and your immediate family members. On the other side, if we destroy our property rights as we have known them since the founding of this nation, and remember, the reason capital influx came to this country more than any other country in the world is for one reason, and that is because we have upheld property rights since the, this, this country was founded. And if we're unable to continue to do that, that could have a, a massive problem as it relates to capital formation and capital aggregation going forward. And so I grapple with that and I, and I, I, I literally, that is the issue that, that worries me the most. To what extent are we going to somehow undermine property rights in this country and start to resemble uh, other countries that we claim we are different from? Next. Uh, how do you feel about providing relief via massive cash distribution to many millions without regard to recipients' financial situation and income or scripts. Okay, so this is what, uh, what's his name? What, what was the presidential candidate, Lance? Who, who, who offered the $1,000? Andrew Yang. What, I'm sorry? Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang, right. So, and everyone thought he was kind of crazy. You know, I did some research on that, and that concept has been around for 400 years. It is not a novel idea that by giving people money, you stimulate the economy. The question is, what will people do with that money? Will they use it for food or will they save it? Will they invest it? And so the real question is, what do they do with it? If everyone saves it, that's probably not great. If everyone spends it, that's probably okay because it stimulates the economy. But at the end of the day, um, I'm being told to speed up here. Okay, keep going. Okay, uh, anyway, so the answer, so the answer to the question is, I think it is something that the government is considering. They're considering to give people 1,200 bucks. And that is something that, you know, just a few months ago would have been thought as ludicrous and ridiculous and unfair. But if it's that what it takes to keep people keep their children fed and, and, and keep stability, you know, we're gonna have to go for it. Next. Um, you want me to go, wait, wait. Okay, we, we have to keep going here because I wanna get to Zach here. Keep and we'll come back to these questions at the end of the presentation. Okay. So keep, uh, keep, keep, keep yeah. filling them out. Yeah, keep, this is great. People. Okay, okay, so we talked about reinstatement, personal loss mitigation, let's keep moving here. Okay, this slide is important and there's nothing on it. What you should consider to continue paying and what you may decide not to pay right now, okay? And it's a tough question, but I think you have to follow your gut and you have to follow and do what you need to do, both for short-term and ultimately for long-term. You know, if you're in a comfortable position where you can pay all your bills, obviously you should do that. But if you think that this crisis is gonna last and as long as it might, not just two or three weeks, but maybe two or three months or maybe six months, then you have to say to yourself, do you need to keep your powder dry and only pay those things that you must pay? And what are those things that you must pay? You're gonna pay your food bill because that's gonna keep you alive. Your mortgage and your rent is a questionable thing because there are gonna be people out there gonna say, well, I'm not gonna worry about that right now because the courts really are in proceeding and I have to make sure that my family has enough food. So I think at the end, if you have enough money to pay for your food, you should pay your mortgage and you should pay them. But ultimately, you should probably be calling your mortgage company right now and asking them for a 60 or 90 day abatement, which they are giving if in fact you call. And so that doesn't mean you're not gonna owe the money. It just means that you don't have to pay it right now. And so I would recommend that if you don't wanna do that yourself, that you call one of our lawyers and we're actually going to assist people in getting mortgage abatements. And in terms of your landlord, you may wanna call your landlord without a lawyer initially. But if that doesn't work, then yes, you should call us to see what kind of workouts you can do. Now, these are for residential. Now, if you're a commercial landlord, like, like the, the retiree, you have to decide how you can stay in business. And more importantly, do you have mortgages? It sounds like you don't have mortgages. So the question is, can you live with half the rent right now and have them paid at the end if they get some money from the government? I don't know. But if you uh, try and evict them right now, 
I think that could be very difficult from a time, time perspective. And I think it is best that we all try and work together. The other thing is the courts are gonna be clogged, alternative dispute resolution, doing workouts, working things out, having lawyers that, that, that on both sides know that it's in everyone's interest to get something done is probably the way that's gonna go. If we're gonna rely on the courts, we've had people who've been in foreclosure for 10 years who are still in their homes. I think even 12 years. So my point is, is that that may not necessarily be the way to go if you're a bank or a financial institution. Okay, next page. Ah, we got the Zach, finally. <laughs> Zach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over to you if I may, okay? All right, thank you, Roy. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Right, go ahead. Um, first of all, Roy, thank you very much for having me, uh, and thank you for the kind words at the beginning. Um, so far, so good. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about bankruptcy and how bankruptcy could help uh, people uh, get through this get through this crisis. And you know, bankruptcy is just another tool that that we have to to get us through this. And um, you know, we talked about financial triage, and that's really that's really what this is right now. Is is how do we timing is a very timing is very important. So everyone has to consider what what to pay now, what can wait a little bit and what can wait a longer time period. And, you know, we don't know when this crisis is gonna end. So as far as people who are contemplating to file bankruptcy, uh, the big question is when to file bankruptcy. And we'll talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about what, what types of bankruptcies are out there. And really, it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's gonna depend on what your particular situation is. But, you know, going back to the timing, just so everyone knows, the bankruptcy courts are open. Uh, we have been filing bankruptcy cases electronically for um, 15 years now, so that continues. Uh, what the bankruptcy courts are doing is all hearings are taking place telephonically. Uh, really, the only change is that we're, we don't have any bankruptcy trials right now, but trials in bankruptcy court uh, is, um, uh, is very rare. So for the most part, bankruptcy court is open and operating, and uh, we can take advantage of all the um, of all the tools that we have in bankruptcy. So on this slide, some of the things that I'm gonna talk about is uh, the different chapters. What is bankruptcy? So bankruptcy is a legal proceeding. It's a proceeding that, again, is one of the tools that we have uh, where we can eliminate or reorganize your debt. Uh, there's chapter seven, which I'm gonna talk about in a few moments. It's a liquidation proceeding where you keep all of your protected property that is called exempt property and a, trust, and a trustee administers your non-exempt property. Then we have chapter 13, which is a personal reorganization where you keep your property and propose a repayment plan to creditors. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about chapter 11 and the new chapter 11, which is called subchapter five, which I think is gonna help a lot of people uh, who are currently struggling. So, um, Going to the next slide, which is chapter seven. Chapter seven is, chapter seven is the most common type of bankruptcy. So chapter seven is a liquidation. It's, it's called a straight bankruptcy. It usually takes three to six months and um, it's, it's best for discharging unsecured debt. So going back to the situation where you have a mortgage, if you wanna modify your mortgage or if you want to cure the arrearages on your mortgage, chapter 13 might be better for you. So chapter seven will get rid of unsecured debt, credit cards, medical bills, and business debts that you personally guaranteed. So how is this relevant now? Uh, again, once we're on the other side and people have been doing their own financial triage and paying what's important to them to keep themselves healthy and secure, there's gonna be debts that are not gonna be paid. And when you're on the other side of this crisis and you're working, there's gonna be a lot of people and businesses that have debts that they can't pay. So for individuals, you know, specifically, Chapter 7 bankruptcy is a tool that can discharge that debt. For a business, uh, it, it, you know, what, what Roy's um, poll uh, was very, it was very good. Hopefully, many small businesses can hang in there. A lot of businesses are closed temporarily with the intention of, of reopening. Uh, for businesses that can't make it, Chapter 7 liquidation is, um, is an option. There's also a proceeding called an assignment for the benefit of creditors. And for those of you uh, who are in Florida, that's something that is state by state. And in Florida, we do have assignments for the benefit of, benefit of creditors. And that's another option as an alternative to chapter seven. But hopefully we can withstand this, this crisis and businesses don't have to close. 
Zach, I want to go to another poll question because it'll help you in terms of what your focus is. Okay, great. Oh, this is a good one. If you're laid off from work, would you change occupations? Yes or no? This is, this is unsure is probably the right answer because unsure is we don't know where this is going. But I think if you're, you know, in a, a market or in a, in, in a business where you know that you're not going to be working for a period of time, you may end up doing a temporary switch and then coming back to what, what you were previously doing. Um, right. But we're going to go, uh, let's go to the next slide, but I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, a, a lot I, of people... I, actually, I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I think this is a critical question for, for you, Zach. We're asking people, how much cash do you have on reserve? And, and you and I talked about this uh, before we went on air here. Uh, less than two weeks, less than four weeks, less than six weeks, don't have any cash reserves or more than six weeks. So it, it looks like about two thirds of us have more than six weeks, but that leaves a third of us that have less than six weeks. And we have folks who have really less than two weeks, less than four weeks. So we have, you know, 15% that have less than, than six weeks. And if you have include those, if less than six weeks is actually 14, is about 30, 30% or, 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 you know, who have less than six weeks. And so what we're really looking at is that this crisis has to be managed. We have to get money into the people's hands quickly or, or we're going to see a meltdown of, 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 of our social fabric. Right, and, and a lot of those people who uh, don't have cash reserves of six weeks or longer, they're gonna have to start using credit. They're gonna have to start using their credit cards um, or, or, other, or other credit options and that, you know, who knows how long this crisis is gonna last and when we're on the other side of the crisis, what's gonna to happen to that debt? And that's something that could potentially be managed in a bankruptcy. I'm gonna put you on the spot, Zach. Should people tap into their IRAs and 401ks or should they go bankrupt not to have to pay that debt? What is your thought? You know, um, generally speaking, it's not a good idea to tap into your 401ks and IRAs because those assets are exempt. If you were to file bankruptcy and discharge your debt, those are assets that, that you would keep in a bankruptcy. So I generally advise against tapping into your 401ks and IRAs. But if you're in a situation where you don't have money to put food on your table, I mean, then, then you have to make that choice. That's right. So it, so it really is becomes a, uh, a, a, a decision of what you do to survive versus what you do later on for your retirement. And assuming the economy gets better, you still could work or do something. It also depends, right. how, old you are. It also depends how old you are, right? If right. At a certain age, yeah, you should be tapping your retirement because that's what it was there for. But if you're kind of young um, and you've saved some money, the question is, do you use that money because you have to? And the answer is, you do what you have to do in these circumstances. I mean, we are in dire circumstances. It's a highly unusual set, set of circumstances, and we have to consider things in, in, in a different in a different way. Con continue. I'm sorry, Zach. Right. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, where we are today, we're, again, everyone has to do what they have to do to stay healthy. And, and stay alive. And we just don't know how long this is gonna take and we don't, know, we don't know what the other side is gonna look like. But for right now, I think people's decisions are based on first and foremost, health and safety. Um, all right, so the next slide is chapter 13 bankruptcy. So chapter 13 is available only to individuals. Uh, it, is, it is best for, um, so some people don't qualify for chapter seven because they either make too much money uh, that's called the means test and there's exceptions and then there's exceptions upon exceptions. So, um, so for those folks who don't qualify for chapter seven, chapter 13 is available uh, for people who have a substantial amount of non-exempt assets that they would lose in a chapter seven, a chapter 13 or a chapter 11 that we'll talk about shortly is a potential option, but also chapter 13 is it's most powerful in assisting with the restructure of debt on mortgages or, ve or vehicles stops foreclosure actions and other collection activities. So again, timing is important. Uh, usually there's a trigger as to when we file a bankruptcy. Uh, I, since there's no foreclosures happening right now, uh, now if you're filing a bankruptcy to stop a foreclosure, filing it now would not help. Filing now would not be uh, the right idea, but at some point, like Roy said, when the floodgates are opened, chapter 13 might help. Now there's a, an anti-modification clause in bankruptcy where you cannot modify the first mortgage um, or any mortgage that's in, in the money uh, in a chapter 13 if it's your home mortgage. That's the, that's the current state of the law right now. 
Um, but that doesn't mean you can't seek to modify, and it doesn't mean that you can't seek to cure the arrearage, cure the arrearages, and maintain them with the regular payments. So those are some of the things that we can do in a in a Chapter 13. Uh, there are debt limitations, however, um, a little bit over a million dollars of secured debt, and a little bit more than four hundred thousand dollars of unsecured debt. Uh, so now we're on to uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So unlike Chapter 13, which is available to only um, individuals, Chapter 11 is available to individuals and businesses, uh, both. Uh, for we, we file a lot of individual, we actually file quite a bit of individual Chapter 11 cases in our district. Uh, it is really good for individuals who exceed the debt limitations of Chapter 13 or who might be within those debt limitations but need to extend payments beyond uh, the limitations of Chapter 13s. It's an option for businesses who are able to restructure their finances. Again, this is all going to um, depend on how long the crisis lasts, if businesses can withstand. We have a lot of uh, clients that are temporarily closed that are waiting for this to end uh, before filing their Chapter 11s. Um, and part of, I guess, foreshadowing for what we're going to talk about when we talk about the new Subchapter 5 bankruptcy, a uh, debtor proposes a plan, it's voted on by creditors, and we need a certain number of votes to get the plan approved. Uh, I, I want to, can, can I say one thing here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, want, I, I want to add something here. And, and I, I, this is a strategy that both individuals and families have to consider. And that is, even as a family, you want to stay in business. As a business, you want to stay in business and you need to raise cash. And, and you can raise cash from lots of sources. Uh, one of the sources is obviously equity lines and credit lines that you have in town. Last time around, those sources seized up during the crisis. And I recall that banks were actually pulling equity lines either because they wanted to, they felt they could, or they weren't supposed to and they did anyway, or in the alternative, uh, people had lost their jobs and, and, the, and the banks felt they were no longer credit worthy. <clears throat> so one of the things you all need to consider is whether or not you should be pulling any cash that you have that may not be available to you and put it in a different bank so that that can happen again. I recall that that was one of the most bitter pills that, that as an individual and as a lawyer, I had to swallow is that banks were doing that. And I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that that won't happen this time, but I just, in my gut, just don't want that to happen. So okay, that's a very good point. Stay in business, raise cash, and you got to learn from what the big boys are doing. What is the very first thing that all the S&P 500, the Fortune 500, the Dow companies did? They hit their equity, they hit their credit lines, and they pulled the cash out, whether they're using it or not, because they know that cash is king in a crisis. And... You know, so if you're saying what, what, what you should be doing, you stay in business, you raise cash, you, you, you hit your equity lines, and then the last thing that you do is you stay in business. It is so much harder to start over when you've developed goodwill in a community for 5, 10, 20, 30 years than to close down and start over again. And so if you've developed a reputation, you have a name in the community, you want to be able to build on that so that you can rebuild the business and keep as many people as employed as, as possible. Even if you have to furlough them, even if you have to cut down hours, you want to somehow stay in business. I mean, even FedEx has cut their hours down. You know, they used to be open like 12, 18 hours a day. They're, they're open like six or eight hours a day now. So we need to learn from, from the folks who are doing this kind of stuff. Okay, got to move on. Um, I know we have, uh, before we, we have about 12 or 14 questions, and um, hopefully Zach will be open in about five minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes or 15 minutes to go through the questions. Go ahead. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so now, now we're up to what is called the Small Business Reorganization Act, and it actually went into effect February 19th of this year, so before really the crisis truly hit the United States, uh, this, this new law came into effect. Um, so what this is, it's a subchapter of Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It's available for individuals and corporations, businesses, and it has a lot of benefits uh, that, that are a lot more substantial than the current Chapter 11. So some of those benefits are it's less expensive than, than a Chapter 11. A normal, tra traditional Chapter 11 can be very expensive, time-consuming. Um, the second benefit, greater leverage from debtors and that accepting votes from creditors is not necessary. I think this is the largest benefit of the new law. Under a traditional Chapter 11, like I said, we need a certain requirement of votes. And if we don't get the votes, then we can't confirm a plan. In some cases, we've been hanging on for one vote. And, in, and if we don't get that one vote, then the, the plan cannot be confirmed. Under the new law, if no one votes for the plan and we abide by all of the other rules of Chapter 11, 
we can get the plan confirmed. This part is huge. Uh, streamlined procedures, and like I said, faster process than traditional chapter 11. Um, going on to the next slide. Let me interrupt for a second. But yeah. to do that, you have to have a plan that, that can suggest what your, your, your gross sales are gonna be, what your business plan is gonna be on the back end of this crisis. So if you went in now, you couldn't in good faith say that you're gonna sell X widgets when no one's buying any widgets from you right now. Isn't that correct? That's an excellent point. And when we talked about this before, we actually have uh, a few clients who we were about to file uh, subchapter five bankruptcy for. And for that exact reason, we held off because again, bankruptcy is about triggers. You know, why, why do we need to file right now? Uh, in, in some instances, if we have an eviction, that's not gonna happen right now or, um, or foreclosure or other court action, that's not gonna happen right now. We don't need to file right now. And, and the reason why we shouldn't file right now is exactly what you said. As part of the subchapter five bankruptcy, you have to come up with a budget. And in some bankruptcy cases, you have to come up with a budget right from, right from the gate. Right when we file, we have to come up with a budget if there are certain issues. And how can, how can we come up with a budget right now? Some of these businesses are closed temporarily and the budget is zero income. So I think um, it's gonna be real tough to tell what the income is. But what we may wanna do is in some cases have a prepackaged bankruptcy ready to go so that when the crisis is over, we're first in line. Because as I began this, this seminar, those people who embraced the soup and got in the soup, got out of the soup first. And, and, and that's something that we really learned. The ones who got in, got out first. So if you, at some point, may have to file, you don't have to file, but at least you may wanna consider that as one of your options. And so you need to have a plan saying, if this lasts for six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, what am I going to do? If this lasts for three, four, six, God forbid, you know, a year, what am I going to do? And so we're here to basically absorb some of that pain and, and, and do the thinking that needs to be done. And ironically, it is that experience that we had from last decade that, that is coming back here. Never in a million years did I think we'd be doing this. Last time we did these seminars, we did them in person. Now, look at me, I'm doing this from my house. Keep going, Zach. Yeah, no, and Roy, that's an excellent point. It's, you know, Filing a bankruptcy, especially filing a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, is not as easy as someone comes in the office one, one, one day and we file it all in that day. It's not, you know, it doesn't work that way. So uh, while it, it, will, it may make sense and it will probably make sense to wait if you're a business to actually file a Chapter 11, especially a Subchapter 5 Chapter 11, it does not make sense to wait until then to start planning. And it's important to you know, talk, talk to an attorney now and start planning it. Those two cases that I told you about that we're hitting the pause button on, they were, you know, for lack of a better word, fully cooked, completely ready to go so that when those clients come back to me and, and the crisis is, you know, over, hopefully sooner than later, all we essentially have to do is hit the button and those clients, they're away they go in bankruptcy. But it takes some time. And I just want to add an editorial, and that is that as part of the American way, the idea of Success, the bus to success is, is part of our genre, it's part of our ethos, and it's also part of the narrative of some people who, who've been elected to high office. That's right, that's right. You know, back, back when we had the last crisis 10 years ago, I think that really destigmatized uh, bankruptcy to a large degree. So many people had to file, the, the, the statistics were sky high, and, and you know, people who never thought in a million years that they'd have to file a bankruptcy found themselves filing the bankruptcy. And they found out that, you know, again, going to, back to the very beginning, it's a tool, it's a legal procedure, and it's not the end of the world. It's what you need to do if you need to do it. Um, okay, so I'll finish up this slide. I know we have, um, we're running out of time. Uh, again, I think the biggest thing to take from this is uh, there is a debt requirement, debt limitation. Uh, you must have no more than two, uh, 2.7, 2,725,625 of um, secured and unsecured debt. Uh, to qualify, and there's been some chatter about, because of this crisis, increasing that, that limitation to either seven, $7. $7.5 million or $10 million, which is going to uh, really help businesses. It's going to mean that the majority of people who uh, are, the majority of people who would be filing Chapter 11 will be able to qualify under this act. Uh, the other thing I wanna mention before you move on, Roy, is, is I know that uh, your, your firm uh, is, um, suppose you're doing consultations on a video basis. We are as well. And I think in this, in this day and age, when we talk about 
planning and, and planning for um, loss mitigation, bankruptcy, and everything else that we're talking about, uh, people should not be afraid of reaching out to, to us now because we have the ability to do that via, via Zoom, via all, all types of video conferencing uh, platforms. Absolutely, and uh, I, I do encourage people to, to be proactive here and not, and not put your head, head, head in the sand here because we're all gonna be in, in the same boat. Um, I wanna take some more, Zach, are we done? I wanna take some more questions from, from the folks online? Absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, here we go. Oh, would you recommend a refinance or a loan modification? I would highly recommend refinancing today as quickly as possible. I talked about the last lecture that if you're still employed, if you still have income, you are a prime candidate to refinance. I would do it as soon as possible, bring your interest rate down, get the best deal possible, rates are lower. You gotta do it now because God forbid you become unemployed, no one's gonna wanna talk to you. Next. Okay. Uh, have you heard that the federal government is considering structuring the bailout TARP style with the government uh, taking equity in the companies they infuse with cash? Yeah, I, I think they may do that. I mean, they did that with, uh, I think, General Motors and, and last time around, and they, they did take stock, and eventually the, 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 the government did buy back uh, or did sell their stock uh, when, when the crisis averted. Um, next one, we have a Section 8 uh, rental properties. Do you expect the housing government to continue to pay their part of the rent? Um, you know, that's a great question. I, I, I bet they do, because if not, it, it, it could cause a crisis. So I think that's, you know, I think the government will do that. Maybe they'll renegotiate the rent, but I do expect them to keep paying, but I'm not the government. Um, hardship letters are have been used with lenders and landlords with few good reaction or, or, or whatever. Do you uh, think having legal representation to negotiate the hardship? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, in, in terms of your lenders, it, it is always helpful to have a lawyer uh, prepare the hardship letter because there are certain buzzwords that, that we like to use and, and, and know at this point what, what the banks respond to because we've been doing this now for, for so long. Um, is there any financial help for realtors? Wow. You know, not yet, not yet. I, I, you know, there are so many groups that are, that are gonna need help, whether you're in the cruise industry, the restaurant industry, the, the tourism industry, the hotel industry. I mean, you know, I think we're all in the same boat and, and I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but I haven't heard anything. Um, this is for Zach. What should someone uh, someone do who is an active Chapter 13 and is currently unable to make the plan payment due to a reduction in income? So if someone's in a plan and they're not going to be able to, to meet it, Zach, what do they do? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, pay something. Pay whatever you can. If, if you're in a pay, plan payment of $200 a month and all you can afford is $10, pay the $10 to the trustee. Uh, that, that's going to delay things. Have your attorney or if, you're pro, if you don't have an attorney in your Chapter 13, contact the trustee's office, uh, but pay something, pay whatever you can, and that, that should delay things a little bit. The trustees understand what's going on. Uh, next question for you, Zach. How successful are involuntary bankruptcies against the business? I would bet they're not gonna be very uh, successful right now, but what, what do you think? No, well, in general, involuntary bankruptcies are very difficult. Uh, there's, there's certain requirements that a creditor must meet to be able to file an involuntary bankruptcy, and if you file one improperly, uh, there can be, uh, there can be damages for the creditor who institutes the involuntary. Okay. I'm going to ask one, one more question and then uh, here, what type of bankruptcy are available to sub S's? Let me try and give this an answer. The answer is that you, you'd have uh, typically an 11, the new sub five would be applicable and possibly in some cases, I guess, a liquidation, which would be a, a, a seven, I guess. Right. But, but typically that's right. Yeah. Chapter, ch chapter seven, chapter 11, chapter seven being the liquidation chapter 11, um, being the reorganization assignment for the benefit of creditors. Really, there's no differentiation between sub S or any other type of company when it comes to business bankruptcies. Okay, uh, we, we had a great question here, which I want to answer about force majeure. How far can residential and uh, businesses uh, go to a a leverage of force majeure? And I want to go to the next slide. Uh, there are addendums that, that are uh, circulating in, in, the, in the real estate on the residential side about trying to get extensions if, if certain service providers are unable to, to meet their obligations. Uh, currently, uh, in both the commercial FAR bar and the residential FAR bar contracts, there's a typical 30-day pr provision that states that if, if there's force majeure, you can adjourn for seven days. And then if after a total of 30 days from the closing date, you're unable to close, under those circumstances, either party can walk away. The question is, what is force majeure? Uh, you know, acts of God typically are, are, are fall into that. 
I think once a state is under a true emergency uh, declared by, by the governor and, and, and by the president as a disaster area, I think under those circumstances, you, you get to really leverage uh, the, the force majeure. There's going to be lots of disputes. There are, there are numerous contracts that we're dealing with where, where we had buyers who were in the middle of buying and the banks pulled the plug. We have sellers who, are, who now can't, can't proceed because maybe uh, they, their, their next deal fell through. And you have these daisy chain chain reactions of someone buying, renting, selling, and the whole thing like, like a set of dominoes is all collapsing. I mean, one of the things we're suggesting under this emergency is that everyone just stay in place and we call a timeout and then, and then everything resets when, when the economy is working again. But, you know, if people don't want to cooperate and do that, it's going to be hard for the courts to uh, enforce any of this when, when, when they're basically working uh, remote like, like we are. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the, the next slide here, which is about renegotiating leases. Uh, we're getting from some, some major, major retailers for, for our clients who, who own commercial property uh, requests. They're, they're called requests, but they're probably demands from, from major retailers who are saying that they're, they're looking for a rent holiday. They're looking for a rent holiday for, for several months, maybe 90 days or 120 days un, until uh, the situation resolves itself. Uh, the landlords, uh, I think, can't really respond until they talk to their banks because they have mortgages and see what their banks want them to respond. Because if they're not getting this major income in from a major retailer, then how are they going to be able to pay their mortgage? And so this is a, a, a calamity because it is a house of cards. It's a set of dominoes and it sets off a chain reaction that frankly is so much more complicated and more crazy than what we've ever had to deal with uh, in, in our professional lives. And I've been practicing now, you know, for, for 33 years as, as a lawyer. And this is something I never envisioned. Um, Lance, are there any more questions we, we have? I think we have a few minutes left. Um, I want to see if there are any polls. You know. no. Okay, we did the four questions. We do have some more uh, questions. Okay, uh, if realtors will be out of work temporarily, we don't have sellers to show properties or allow people in their homes and don't have enough buyers due to the uncertainty in their jobs. I, I agree, that's, that's, you're gonna have to figure out how to survive over this next several week, several month period, because then you will come back fast and furious. There will be people who have to move, who are gonna relocate, there'll be dislocation, families will change, there will be unfortunate circumstances that, that, that require people to, to make different moves, and, and from that, uh, you will be very busy, because when there is change, realtors do very well, as do lawyers sometimes. What if you can't pay your rent? I guess is the question. It, it, well, if you can't pay your rent, I mean, you're not moving out and you're not being evicted. So the first thing you do is you call your landlord. You call your landlord and say, hey, you know, I'm an Uber driver and I'm now making 20% of what I used to make. Uh, or I worked in the hotel industry or I worked in the cruise industry. And you just be absolutely candid with them about your predicament. And if they try and throw you out, you call our office because legally they cannot do that right now. And so um, ultimately, when the health crisis averts, the economic crisis will not avert, but at least you will be able to go out and you will be able to find other work. There'll be so many companies that are, are growing because they're part of a new economy and, and you will have to retool. And at that point, you will be able to either move in with someone or you will be able to find a place yourself. The problem now is you can't move in with someone and the, and the government, as a matter of public health, does not want you to move in with someone. And so you're sheltering in, in, in place. And that is something that is more important than the landlord, unfortunately, collecting this month's rent. It is also more important than the bank collecting their mortgage payment. And because of that, uh, we all have to work together as a community to figure this out. But it is a ripple effect. And it is a domino effect. And it affects everyone uh, that I know. And it, it's something that, that we've just never had to deal with before. Uh, let me see if there are any more questions. I think we have two or three more questions. Oh, great. Wow. If there, are there any more questions, Lance? I saw there were. OK, OK. I'm, I'm being told I, I'm, I'm done. Um, anyway, I want, I want you all to, first of all, um, think about how we can work together as a community and how we all can get, the, get through this together. What we're doing at this firm is to provide this community service. Obviously, it's an opportunity for you to ask questions. Obviously, we're not providing uh, specific legal, legal input for any of you, but we're more than available to talk to you about your personal situation. 
next week at noon, Tuesday, next week at noon, Zoom in at, at noon, we'll be talking about strategic default, how it will be different from last time. Strategies to renegotiate debts, including unsecured credit card debt and other loans. And Zach, if you're available, you're going to be more than welcome to join us again. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Uh, it is our pleasure. And uh, Roy Oppenheim from the trenches, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and, and, and sharing your time with us. Have a great day and Godspeed and may you all stay healthy.